When Labour came into power, they promised to make one change that could have a huge impact on the UK property market. And on the surface, it sounds like it could make property investment a lot riskier. However, I've been a property investor, a landlord and a tenant for over 18 years and I have a slightly different take on the topic. I think that the danger that everyone's worried about already exists, but most people don't understand the law well enough to realise it. So in this video, I'm going to reveal what the number one danger for property investors actually is and how to avoid it regardless of what the government does next. So to bring this dilemma to life in the simplest way possible, I'm first going to explain the current legal landscape using two characters, Chris and Sally. So Sally is renting a property from Chris and she is reaching month 10 of her one year tenancy. She's been an ideal tenant, always paying her rent on time and keeping the property in good condition. However, Chris has decided to move back to the local area and he wants to move into the property himself in the next couple of months. So he needs Sally to leave. Now, because Sally hasn't done anything wrong, Chris would need to use what's called a no-fault eviction, which he can do now, but won't be able to do in the future. As you'll see later, that's not the real danger you need to be aware of. So a no-fault eviction allows a landlord to bring the tenancy agreement to an end, despite the tenant not having done anything wrong. Chris needs to give Sally at least two months notice and that notice period can't end before the end of the 12 month fixed term that was agreed. For example if the lease was agreed up until the 10th of July he would need to give notice no later than the 10th of May ideally a bit earlier and then she would need to leave on the final day. So once that day arrived Sally needs to go. She might not be happy about it she might have wanted to stay for many years longer but she's unlikely to fight it. So Two months later, Chris has an empty property that he can move into. This might seem a bit unfair on poor Sally, and that's one of the reasons that no-fault evictions are being done away with. However, in practice, no-fault evictions are often also used by landlords to get rid of tenants who aren't paying rent or are making the neighbours suffer with antisocial behaviour. And the reason for this is simple. When you use a no-fault eviction, if the Sally in your situation ignores the notice to move out, you don't have to bring evidence of any wrongdoing to the court. You avoid any uncertainty of what mood the judge will be in that day and guarantee an eviction so long as you follow the process correctly. This, in theory, allows you to get your property back on the market quickly and earning you rental income again. And this is why investors and landlords are so worried about the government getting rid of this option. But here's what a lot of people don't realise about no-fault evictions and something that often gets overlooked. Even if you use a no-fault eviction and avoid going to court, it can still take the best part of a year to evict a tenant. So they're really not the saving grace that everyone thinks they are. And to explain what I mean by this, I'm going to introduce you to two new characters, Mark and Richard. Mark is Richard's tenant, but unlike Sally, he's lost his job, he has no savings, and he's been very erratic with his rent payments. And at the moment, he's two months in arrears. In this situation, Richard has two options. His first option is he could start the eviction process citing a particular fault. In this case, Mark's failure to pay the rent. He can do this as soon as Mark has missed his second rent payment and give him 14 days notice that he needs to leave. If Mark hasn't left after those 14 days, Richard will need to apply for a court hearing. And if Mark hasn't resolved the issue by the date of the court hearing, the court has no choice but to order him to leave. But from Richard's point of view, there's a big problem with this. At any time before the court hearing, Mark can just pay off some of his arrears to put him back under the two-month threshold, which means the court doesn't have to order an eviction. The judge can choose to evict on the grounds of persistent rent arrears, but doesn't have to. Richard doesn't like this uncertainty, but luckily for him, he currently also has option two, because it turns out that just like Sally, Mark is also 10 months into to a fixed 12 month tenancy. So instead of the whole messy fault based process, Richard can just go down the no fault route and cut his losses. As we've already seen, the rules here are pretty simple. You need to give the tenant at least two months notice and it needs to come at or after the end of a fixed term tenancy. But unlike Sally, even after being served what's called the section 21 notice asking him to leave, Mark decides to sit tight. Not out of malice, he just can't afford to do anything else. He has no savings and he doesn't really have anywhere else to go. So so what happens next? Well, Richard can apply for a court order. And even though the no-fault route is all done based on the paperwork and doesn't require an in-person hearing, if you forget to dot one T or cross one I, the court will throw out your application and make you start again. Luckily, Richard is an experienced investor, so he does everything perfectly. And as we've seen, there is no ambiguity about it. The court will order Mark to leave. However, even if you submit the absolute perfect application, it could still take eight weeks for the court order to come through. So now, we are four months into the process and the order itself then gives the tenant 
and then another two weeks notice to leave the property. But Mark is still in the same situation. He's got nowhere else to go. So in the meantime, he's applied to be rehomed by the council. And the council, although they shouldn't, has told him that until he's physically removed by bailiffs, they won't be able to help him. So he ignores the court order and stays put. At this point, Richard only has one other option, which is to apply for an appointment for the bailiffs to remove him. But because the court system is so underfunded and overloaded, the date of this appointment could easily be another eight to ten weeks into the future. In fact, research from the NRLA has found that the average amount of time from claim to repossession across most of the country is 20 to 25 weeks. That's pretty much six months, and that doesn't include the initial two-month notice period. If Richards is the average scenario, that's six months where he doesn't earn a penny in rental income. And if he's in London, where the average is higher because the courts are even more overloaded, he's looking at nine months. That's nine months where Richard has to pay for the mortgage and maintenance costs, all from his own pocket, which obviously is the last situation you want to be in as a property investor. So as you can see, no-fault evictions aren't the holy grail that a lot of people think they are. Sure, landlords will be sorry to lose this option. As you can see from the difference between the two lines on this chart, no-fault evictions are somewhat quicker, and their removal will put more pressure on the courts, probably increasing the average weight even further. But even before they're abolished, you can find yourself with no income and all your costs for the best part of a year, even if you haven't done anything wrong. So the biggest danger for property investors isn't the change in legislation, it's the risk of picking the wrong tenant. This will be the case when the new law passes, maybe even more so, but it's very much the case even now. So what can you do about it? How can you deal with the situation and mitigate this risk? Well, the best way to deal with these kinds of situations is to avoid them altogether. And there are five tactics that I've personally used over the years. And while I've had my fair share of bad experiences, I've got to hold my hands up and say that all of them were, to some extent, my fault. And since I've started following all these steps, I've not had any major problems. So the first and most basic step to avoid a bad tenant is to reference any applicant thoroughly. You can do this yourself or outsource it, but in either case, you should be seeing solid proof of income and their ability to afford the rent. You should also be taking a reference from the applicant's employer to make sure that they are employed where they say they are and earning the amount they claim. Ideally, you also want to take a reference from a previous landlord to confirm that they have a good track record of paying rent on time and have looked after the place. Of course, you're not going to be able to get all this information from every applicant. You might get a first-time renter or someone who's only just moved to the UK. But generally speaking, a good reference can give you a solid foundation on how to judge an applicant. By the way, remember how the tiniest mistake can get your case thrown out of court? Well, make sure to download our checklist for letting and managing a property, which includes all the legal requirements you need to follow, as well as helping you to select the right tenant in the first place. There's a link in the description. Anyway, a reference is only going to get you so far because, as you know, past performance isn't an indicator of future results. And any number of things could happen to someone's circumstances once they've moved in. They could get fired from their job, get a divorce, or develop a gambling addiction. The reality of property is you're dealing with people and literally anything can happen. Luckily, there are a few extra things you can do to protect yourself against the risk. And I find that a good way to think about this is to divide it into two different buckets. Situations where your tenant can't pay and situations where they won't pay. To avoid the situation of a tenant who can afford to pay their rent but refuses to, the best thing you can do is ask for a guarantor. This is basically someone who agrees to pay the rent should the tenant fail to. An ideal guarantor will have a stable income and will also own a property, which means they'll have an asset at risk if they refuse to pay. The process of making a formal claim against the guarantor can be long and expensive and might not really be something that you want to do. But the simple threat of being sued when a tenant won't pay their rent can be enough to incentivize them to persuade them to start paying. Things do get trickier when you've got a mark kind of tenant who literally can't afford the rent. Now, the best thing to do here is to consider taking out rent and legal protection insurance. This policy will kick in when the tenant has missed a certain number of rent payments, after which the insurers will start making payments to you on the tenant's behalf. And some policies will also cover your legal costs to remove the tenant from the property. What's great about this is that the insurance provider will help you to drive things forward because they'll want to stop making the rental payments themselves as soon as they can. Even so, as much as this insurance is going to protect you in a can't pay situation, it's also going to increase your costs. And it's not something you can rely on exclusively. The insurance provider is also going to insist on solid referencing and will only agree to insure people who are a pretty low risk anyway. But if you only rent out one property and missed payments will severely affect you financially, it's definitely something to consider. Whereas if you have 10 properties and a few missed payments isn't the end of the world, you may choose not to. Now, if you do decide to take 
out a policy. It's important to read through all the terms and conditions so you know exactly when the policy will kick in, how much they'll pay out, and what the excess is. Because there's no point paying fat monthly fees to an insurer that doesn't pay out when something goes wrong. There's something else you can do to avoid both can't pay and won't pay situations, which is to take all the rent up front before they move in. And while you can do that, I sometimes do, it is not a solution to your potential problem. Why? Because the tenant could pay for a year up front and then refuse to leave after that year and you end up in the very situation you were trying to avoid. There's a very real risk that the allure of an upfront payment can make you relax your standards and I've actually fallen into this trap before. An applicant offered to pay me six months rent in advance and I frankly was busy and lazy and saw the opportunity to get them in quickly without messing about. So I scrimped on my referencing and long story short I never saw another payment after that initial six months. It took me many months to get them out of the property using by the way, the no fault procedure, even though that very much was fault. In the end, my laziness and greed ended up costing me thousands of pounds. So I'm not saying don't take payments up front. What I'm saying is don't let these sway your judgment of a potential tenant. And ultimately, the best thing that you can do is offer a great property in a popular area at a fair price. If you do this, you're going to have the largest possible pool of applicants to choose from. So you can do proper referencing and find the lowest risk tenant who will consistently pay their rent and look after the property. However, as I mentioned earlier, earlier in the video. Even if you choose the best tenant in the world, the property market is a legal minefield for investors nowadays. And even the most basic mistake can lead to huge fines and in some cases prison time. So check out this video next where I run through the five biggest mistakes that landlords are making so you can keep on the right side of the law.